What is up, everybody? It is me, Devil Never Cry, and in this video, we're gonna make sense of Near Replicant. We're gonna take a look at the story, try and figure out why things are the way things are, and what the endings mean for the protagonist and his party, as well as the rest of the world of Near, because the implications are pretty severe. Of course, it goes without saying that there will be spoilers for Near Replicant, so you have been warned. To kick things off, let's go all the way back to the beginning of Near Replicant, and then go back even further to the event of Drakengard or Dragon Dragoons ending E. Without getting into the events of Drakengard all too much, a dragon and a giant appear in modern day Tokyo thanks to magic. A battle ensues on a grand scale, of course, with the dragon ultimately prevailing and the giant being felled. But not before it crumbles into what seems like dust and is spread all across the land. But, of course, things aren't all that simple, and it wasn't dust that the giant had disintegrated into. It was actually otherworldly particles known as meso that are the cause for the White Chlorination Syndrome, or WCS for short. And shortly after the giant was felled, so was the dragon. Turns out Japan didn't take too kindly to an unidentified flying object with mass power flying in its airspace. Upon its defeat, the dragon had also fallen from the sky, but not before disintegrating as well. It turns out the particles from the dragon's defeat were used as the basis for magic development in the world of Nier, and also forms as the basis for the Gestalt project and projects number six and number seven, which should ring a bell if you've played through Nier already. Getting things back on track though, White Chlorination Syndrome, WCS, the disease that essentially caused the downfall of humanity in the world of Nier. Humans that came into contact with the meso particles from the giant came down with the White Chlorination Syndrome and were forced into a choice. A pact with a god of another dimension, which would essentially transform them into a monster, chaining them to be this god's servant forever, or the refusal of this pact, which was essentially death, as their bodies would be rendered into salt almost immediately and their life would be extinguished. A pretty harrowing choice, right? One day you're a random citizen in Japan, living out your life, and before you know it, there's dragons, giants, magic, and a pact with a god from another dimension. Monsters, or more accurately, people who decided to agree to this pact, became known as legions. Mindless monsters who were aggressive towards humans and were able to spread the white chlorination syndrome to any other human they came in contact with. So far, none of this might seem relevant to Near Replicant whatsoever, especially considering the game does not go out of its way to explain any of this to the player. And thus enters Project Gestalt. The humans were fighting a losing war against the legions and the white chlorination syndrome. They were essentially forced to almost the brink of extinction, I guess you could say. And that is when they decided to create the Project Gestalt with the help of the magic from the dragon that fell from the sky. They essentially decided to separate their souls from their body only reuniting the two when the White Chlorination Syndrome was essentially eradicated from the world. A soul removed from a body was known as a Gestalt, and from the original body, from the genetic makeup, a recreation, a copy was made, a lifeless, soulless shell known as a Replicant. And during this time, the Gestalts were meant to be placed into a hibernation of sorts, and during this large period of inactivity where the Gestalts were sleeping, the replicants and the androids were said to have destroyed all of the legions and consequently the white chlorination syndrome. But of course, things don't always go the way they're supposed to. During this period of inactivity for the Gestalts, the replicants had begun to take on a life of their own. They had essentially gained sentience. And due to this newfound sentience and self-awareness, they rejected their original Gestalts. 
This effect, along with another factor we'll touch upon in a second, causes a relapse which not only causes the Gestalts themselves to lose their own sentience and become hostile, it also causes the corresponding replicant to gain the Black Scroll. Now at first, the Black Scroll might not seem like a bit of an issue, but things get all the more spicier. You see, the good thing about the replicant system is that it's made up of genetic data, right? If a replicant dies, if anything happens to it, it can simply be remade from data retrieved from the original Gestalt. However, should a Gestalt start to relapse, for example, if a replicant begins to gain any sentience and that replicant in and of itself gets the black scroll, the replicant system does not work. It can't retrieve any replicant data from the relapsed Gestalt, and so that means that if that replicant is gone, it is gone for good. So the Black Scroll is serious business. It is essentially a death mark. To prevent it, Gestalts themselves have to have their relapse prevented, which is essentially the purpose of the androids that I mentioned before. In the game, you know them as Devola and Popola. The androids, or the twins, have been watching over the world, watching over the replicants, watching out for white chlorination syndrome, essentially monitoring the entire world until the Project Gestalt can be completed. The reason that they're working with the Shadow Lord and the reason for their supposed heel turn into villains is that the Shadow Lord was the original Gestalt. Or to be clearer, the first successful Gestalt. Humanity had figured out a way to separate the soul from the body, uh, but there were a few failed experiments along the way, with the Shadow Lord, aka the original Nier that you see at the beginning of the game, being the first successful Gestalt. Being the genesis point for the project, the researchers decided that all of the subsequent Gestalts made after the Shadow Lord would be based off of the Shadow Lord, which makes sense, right? You've got a project that is successful, let's go ahead and take that same process and apply it to everybody else. The issue here is that the researchers had failed to account for the Shadow Lord's own genetic instability, which meant that some of the other Gestalts made after him were also corrupted. Now, to keep these Gestalts from deteriorating any further, Meso was collected from the Shadow Lord to keep them in a sort of stasis. And with that piece of information, things finally start to line up and everything begins to fall into place. You see, if the Shadow Lord should meet an untimely end, if he should perish or die, for example at the hands of his replicant hell-bent on achieving revenge and getting the sister back at any cost, well then all of those gestalts that he's currently keeping in stasis with those meso particles, they all go into a relapse. And if they all go into a relapse, their corresponding replicants will come down with the Black Scroll. And as you all know, once replicants get the Black Scroll, there is no going back. They will all die as well. And to put things into perspective, all of humanity will die. There is no coming back. There is no failsafe. If they relapse, the Black Scroll shortly follows, and they are done for. Now, I tell a bit of a fib there, tell a bit of a lie, because there is actually a failsafe in the form of Devola and Popola, the android twins. If anything major should happen during the Project Gestalt, for example, the Black Scroll or the relapse of Gestalts, they would be able to force the reunification of the Shades and the Gestalts along with their replicants by combining the powers of Grimoire Vice and Grimoire Noir, which is why the twins had guided the protagonist near all the way to Grimoire Vice to gather all of those sealed verses and to get over to the Shadow Lord because they expected Grimoire Vice to essentially merge with Noir, use their power, and essentially save all of humanity from extinction. What they weren't banking on, though, is Grimoire Vice not having any of his memories, or that when he does gain his memories back, he'd continue to fight for the purposes of saving Yona. And as you know, during the heart-wrenching climactic finale, Grimoire Vice destroys Noir. Of course, he himself has his physical form destroyed, but Vice does stick around, and with that, the failsafe is gone. 
There is no way to reunify the Gestalts and Shades with the Replicants en masse, and humanity is doomed. After everything is said and done and the dust settles, the protagonist and Yona essentially live out their lives until they have the Black Scroll and they die. And that is a near replicant wrapped up nice and neatly. Pretty bleak way to cap things off for the protagonist dooming all of humanity to extinction for their own selfish want. But it is what it is. If you enjoyed today's video, do be sure to leave a like and consider subscribing as there is more near content on the way. And of course, it goes without saying, if there's anything I've missed, let me know down in the comments below. I've tried to keep things clear and concise here, trimming the fat, essentially, and keeping all the good bits. And with all that said and done, it has been me, Devil Never Cry. I'd like to thank all of you for watching. And as always, I'll see you all next video.